Well, I get an opportunity to introduce our speaker for today. Pastor Jim Critcher lives in the Washington, D.C. area where he serves with the senior leadership team of Grace Covenant Church in Chantilly. That's the church that sent us here to plant. Prior to coming to D.C., he was a senior pastor at Grace Covenant Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. A master class student of the world-renowned guitarist Christopher Parking. Parking. Pastor Jim's musical experience encompasses that of professional musician, university instructor, worship ministry leader, recording engineer, as well as an owner of a media production company. A recognized prophetic voice, he travels domestically and internationally ministering to individual leaders, churches, and in conferences. Pastor Jim and his wife Angie have been married for 43 years and live in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. They have two grown children and four perfect grandchildren. <laughs> Would you please welcome a friend of this house? Yes, a father of this house. A father of this house. <laughs> a leader of this house. Yes. Pastor Jim Pritchard. Well, good morning, church. I guess it's afternoon now. Get to be, you know, get, get to be my age and you're not quite sure anymore. I used to make all these jokes about Pastor Duke being old and then all, it's all come home to roost, let me just tell you. Oh my goodness. My wife and I are having senior moments all the time now. By the way, in May will be 45 years of marriage and so... These are details that one needs to get right, let me tell you, and that you so that you can go another 45 years. Hallelujah. It is such a joy to be here, with the exception of being here with Brian Schweppe, but other than that, it is so good to see so many faces here, and you know, say you do your worst all the time, and, and you do your worst best, I might, too, I might add. Long-standing relationship, all right? We, we don't really care for much, each other much, but... Um, <laughs> But it is a delight to be here. Love your pastors. My goodness, what God is doing here in Myrtle Beach. Go ahead. You know, I, I, I say this as I travel a bit, but you can tell what God has in store for people on the basis of the leaders that God gives that people. You know, I can look at a husband and see the wife that God gives that husband to see what God has inherent in that man. Now, all of us married so far uphill, we can't even see the hill. I got that. Are you with me? My wife even said to me in the last week, she said, I don't know why I married you. I and, also said I didn't know why you married me. Well, that's true, too. She did, she did, she did clarify that statement. But she didn't, she, it was a lot of faith involved, let me just tell you. But God gives to a people, leaders, that portends something of the destiny that God has. And whether it is a nation, I believe, whether it's a church, whether it's in a family unit, a business, whatever it is. And I look at Pastor Sean, Pastor the Nell, and I'm saying, wow, God's got something big, big for Rise Community Church. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. This morning, I want to speak a message to you that is purely prophetic. Now, you have a prophetess that helps lead this house. And so you, I don't have to, I don't have to qualify the word prophetic. Amen. But I've been speaking this message in some form really since the summer of last year. And so it's a message that at the time was prophetic. And now is really more just reporting the news. But I still think that God has some things for us to hear today to cooperate with that that the Holy Spirit is doing in our midst in this hour. Yeah. One of the most seminal figures in Scripture we find appearing in 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. 
a Tishbite. Now, you got to be tough to be a Tishbite. I don't even know what a Tishbite is. It just sounds bad. <laughs> you get the impression that if you were a Tishbite, you got called out and beat up a lot on the playground. You know what I'm saying? There's that Tishbite. Get him. <laughs> so the Tishbite shows up. And it's the only place in Scripture that we see this, but his first appearance on the scene is pronouncing a curse. This is how he makes his entrance. It's the prophet Elijah. And he says, there will be no rain, no dew on the land for the next few years except at my command. Now, James tell us, tells us that Elijah was a man just like us. I ain't never had any influence over the weather. <laughs> I appreciate it. I know what James is trying to say right there. But, I mean, this is, this is the guy. And he pronounces a curse and sends Israel into calamity. I mean, no rain, no agriculture, no economy. And so for a period we find for three, three and a half years, there is this drought that cripples that place. And what was the curse about? It was about the apostasy of Ahab and his leadership in a nation. You know, we have found ourselves in a very unique three and a half year period. Have we not? Think about it for a moment. Somewhere at the beginning of 2020, this virus that no one had ever heard of began to make its move globally. This was not something that just affected one location, one people group, one nation. It was a global pandemic, the likes of which we had never seen before in our generation. And here we are coming up on a similar three and a half year period of time. Isn't that fascinating? And at that time in the first quarter of 2020, myself and others began to prophesy this picture of a plow that God was dropping down into the nations and beginning to open it up. I remember in the leaders meeting at Grace, I think it was March of 2020, I prophesied that God was about to plow open the church and plow open the nations, but that what he was doing was opening furrows that the seeds of revival and opening furrows where the rains of revival would have room to grow. And here we are. Here we are. Plows creating those furrows. And we're on the precipice of what I believe and others like myself, we believe is one of the greatest historic outpourings of God in generations. Here we are. And I want you to hear something, ladies and gentlemen. God has chosen you and me. Listen to me. Not just to be spectators, but to be participants and stewards. And I look around and I'm thinking, seriously? You, you're going to use me. You're going to use uh, Have you looked in the mirror lately? God said, yeah, I'm going to use you. And it's easy to just sit in church and just say, well, you know, let the folks up front do it. But one of the things that's going to set this move apart is the very people that God's going to use. Stay with me for a moment. Isaiah 9 says the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. How many of you have felt that shadow in the past three and a half years? Every one of us in this room have been somehow affected by this global pandemic. Some of us buried family members. Some of us have been to funerals, lost jobs, been economically affected. That shadow of death. And right now, pe people are just beginning to uncover sort of the emotional, mental toil that this last season of time has brought on humanity. But it says, a light has dawned. And you have enlarged the nation, increased their joy. 
And they rejoice before you as people rejoice at what? Come on. The harvest. Stay with me. As men rejoice when dividing the plunder. And ladies and gentlemen, God is giving you and me the privilege of this moment. Hear me. The privilege. Show this first picture if you would. This first picture is a little place in Wilmore, Kentucky. It's a black and white picture. And this picture was taken when it shows up. It, it shows up February 1970. What is known as the Asbury Revival. Now, maybe some of you have been reading about this because not only did Christian media pick this up, but the national media also picked this one up. But this is February of 1970, a little college in Wilmore, Kentucky. Interestingly enough, and you can see by the bad haircuts and the funky clothes that that's an older picture. What's interesting is that firsthand account of that, my wife's brother was a student at Asbury and was in this very revival. And this revival were just some students that just wanted more of God. Next picture. This picture was taken in February of 2023. Same auditorium, better clothes and better haircuts. (laughs) But the very same thing happened at this little school. Some students hanging out after a chapel service, wanting more of God, and God came. Salvations begin to happen. Folk begin to come from all over the world, disrupted everything going on in that little city of Wilmore, Kentucky. I got a call from David Hermes, who's one of our church planters. He's in Denver. And he said, Pastor, he said, I don't want to get on a bus and go to Wilmore. I want Wilmore to come here. What do we do to see this revival, to see this awakening come to Denver? I thought, wow, a hundred salvations. Listen to me. At a little school in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Go ahead. And whether you know it or not, and I don't take anything away from the the ministry and the campus ministry going on here, but a hundred salvations in the first quarter of the year, let me just tell you, the Holy Ghost has got a little something to do with that. You are experiencing it in your midst right now, enjoying the fruit of this outpouring. Don't miss it. Simeon. We usually talk about Simeon, Luke, the second chapter around Christmas. But this old, this old weird dude, you remember Simeon? <laughs> Taking children from their parents. You get arrested for that today. <laughs> Joseph and Mary show up and this old man totters over and he takes this child and begins to prophesy. He said, Lord, you, you promised me that I would not die. Until I saw with my own eyes the consolation of Israel. Now that I've seen, you can release me in peace. My wife wife and I were ministering at a conference in 2021. And one of this, this, this all saints of the Lord, you wouldn't know his name, don't worry about it. Except that as a teenager, he began to travel with a man named William Branham. William Brownham, one of the great miracle workers, revivalists of the 20th century. And some of that same anointing rests on this man. But in 21, God showed me, he said, his name is Emmanuel Canastracy. He said he's got cancer and it's serious. Man's in his late 80s. About a month later, we got a report that he did indeed have cancer. Now, when you're... 88, 89 years old, they basically pat you on the head, send you home. He's had a full life. But for someone like Emmanuel, I told my wife, I said, of all the people on the planet, don't count him out. In 2022, 
He stood there and he opened that conference the same way that he has for the past 25 years. Cancer free. But here's what God told him. Just like what God had told Simeon, he told Emmanuel Canastracy, he said, you will not die until you see the first fruits of this next revival. With your own eyes, God has kept him alive that he could see that which you and I are now experiencing. My goodness. We're seeing it in the natural. California, a 1,200-year drought being broken. 1,200 years. It's not Now, yes, it's in our, our contemporary news, but this is a 1,200-year cycle. Rain coming from everywhere. You see the before and the after pictures. It's incredible. And what's interesting is that they're calling this atmospheric rivers. I don't even know what that is. I don't know what an atmospheric river is, but I do know what an Ezekiel 47 river of God is as it begins to move. But now we're seeing things in the natural. Fort Lauderdale. Hello? 26 inches of rain in 24 hours. The only question is, when this water begins to fall, will there be any space for it? Will there be any preparation, whether it's in your life, whether it's in the church, that when it begins to come, we've got space for it. We've got room for it. Someone wrote, as all of this water began to fall on the west coast of this nation, that no new reservoirs have been built in California in the past 50 years. Oh, my goodness. Because when the rain comes, it's here. Fort Lauderdale. I mean, places that had not seen water for a long time, like the airport. All of a sudden now, here it was. My goodness. What's critical for us in this hour is that God would open our spiritual senses and that we would make preparation. I'll come back to this point in a moment. But many times we narrowly define faith as just believing a thing. Expectation. And that is part of it. The assurance of things what? Hope for, but what? Not yet seen. That is part of the definition. But I, could I submit it's an incomplete response. Is that a more complete response is preparation that the true essence of faith is yes expectation but it's married to preparation stay with me and i want to look at two primary passages this morning one in the old new testament and one in the old we'll start with the one in the new testament matthew 25 and for the sake of time i'm not going to read the passage but you know it it's one of two parables that are in this chapter but it's about The virgins and the oil. Most of you that have been around church for any time, you know this one. Ten virgins, they're, they're waiting for the bridegroom. They've got their lamps. They've got their oil. At least some of them do, extra oil. The bridegroom is a long time in coming. How many of you know that many times we get a word, but it's a long time in coming? And it says that both groups of folk fell asleep. A lot of the church is asleep. Waiting on a word, waiting on a promise. And then around midnight, the cry went out, the bridegroom is coming. And they wake themselves up and five had brought extra oil knowing that it it may be a while. But then five didn't and they say to the other five, give us some of yours. And they say, you nuts, Go go find yourself a Walmart that's open 24 hours and buy some yourself. You know, and I, I look at that, and sometimes my sense of Christian charity gets violated. This is like, come on, share. Come on, help a brother out here, share. It's like, no, 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 we might run out ourselves. And while that five were off trying to find an oil vendor, the bridegroom came, the five went in. Sometime later, the five come back, knocking on the door, let us in, but it was closed to them. Now, we know that this most accurately interpreted as a picture of salvation. 
But if you'll let me apply this for a moment this morning, I think it can also speak to the moment in which we find ourselves of one of preparation. I have a very unhappy relationship with oil. My wife and I were given a station wagon when we were first married. I mean, I think everybody has to drive a station wagon. It's, I think it's required. And most of the time, it's a hand-me-down car from parents where the implication is, fill it with grandchildren and come back. <laughs> and I don't know what it was about these old busted land yachts, but for whatever reason, they were always brown or tan or they were, they, were, uh, they were just ugly cars. And you had that seat in the back that faced out the rear window. So the children sitting in the back had a whole different vacation than the ones in the front. <laughs> My wife and I had a 1970-something Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser. Now, most of you don't even know what an Oldsmobile is, much less a Vista Cruiser. But it was, it was think of a hearse with seats in it. That'd be the best way of how to explain what this thing was. But somewhere around Christmas time, the red light came on on my dash, and I thought, well, that's special. It's Christmas. The turn indicators are green, and they flash, and the red light is staying on over here. It's a real Advent thing going on. Until one Sunday, we were on the way to church, and my car utters this sound from underneath the hood which sounded like it had its origins in hell itself. And my car just said, we're done. We're done. Coasted to the side of the road. These were pre-cell phone days. So sometime later, the car got towed. Mechanic in our church, Kenny. I'll never forget Kenny's name. Can't remember mine most mornings, but I remember Kenny. Because it was one of the traumatic moments of my life. Because we were young, dumb, broke. I said, so I'm thinking, you know, it's going to be some part. They'll screw it to the side of the engine and we'll keep on going. Kenny said, I knew that was bad. <laughs> so he reached out and he handed me something that looked like it had been, excuse me, but like barfed out of a demon is the best way I know how to put it. <laughs> and it was this black gelatinous mob, blob, blob, blob. I can't even say it. He said, here is the oil out of your oil pan. Now, let me help you. You're not supposed to be able to handle oil. You're not supposed to be able to hand your oil to someone. It is designed to be viscous, liquid, flowing. Come on. But you see, I had neglected the oil in my car. I thought oil fairies came at night. Just check these things for me. And it cost me a $1,200 long block, which is about what the car was worth. But you see, many of us, we're the same way. The Holy Ghost is supposed to lubricate those parts of our life. Keeps us from seizing up some morning. We use words like burn out. Well, that's many cases that you haven't been checking your oil. You see... We go back to the parable here for a moment. Both of these groups of virgins, they were qualified. We're qualified because of the blood. They had the same revelation. Bridegroom's coming. They were in anticipation of an amazing moment. And yet, both groups got tired and they nodded off. And yet only one group was able to participate. And it was on the basis of preparation. So we need to ask ourselves some questions. First of all, defining some terms. Words like awakening, revival, renewal. And these are more ecclesiastical words that people like to argue over. But let me just say to you that for the most part, Revival, revive, means something that was alive that needs to be revived. Revival is a phenomenon for the church. Awakening is something for 
those that have not been vibed the first time. It's for our cities, our communities, our nations. But it's the same outpouring of God. Are you with me? The theological debates over Asbury, they're already starting. Is it really God? Because the expectation of what is supposed to be, it ain't quite right, Pastor Sean. Pentecost. Can we talk about something that won't quite right? Yeah, we had that strange prophecy in Joel that your sons and daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream and all that kind of stuff. But what we don't see anywhere portended in the law and the prophets or anywhere in Hebrew oral tradition were tongues of fire and rushing wind. Where would that come from? It ain't, it, it's, it's, it's not in the text. And so can you imagine for a moment you got the one group over here you know, they're worshiping God, switching off languages without Rosetta Stone. You know, I mean, they're just, they're going for it. Then you got this other group over here, and they're like, they drunk. <laughs> and in any outpouring of God, you've always got two folk. You got one folk that are under the water spout. You got the other folk saying, they drunk. <laughs> the charismatic renewal of the 60s, 70s. You had God trying to bring his spirit into historical denominational settings. And they said, we good. Day drunk. And here we are once again. Our expectations of what is this going to be? What if it doesn't follow a historical precedent of the past? My finance guy trying to make me feel better. I just, want to str- I just want to strangle him. My $17 in my retirement account that's now worth 17 cents. <laughs> well, you know, it's time in the market, not time in the market. <laughs> what if this isn't historical? What if there's no bull around the corner? Just a bear continuing to eat my 17 cents. What if this... It's not historical precedent. It's the same thing with revival. What if this doesn't look like the historical revivals of the past? Will we still call it God? Because it doesn't meet our criteria. It doesn't meet our expectations. Let me tell you, God loves offending you. Some preacher said at one point, he said, God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. Oh, my. Leonard Ravenhill, years ago, he said, one of my great concerns is that the church knows so much about the move of God, they're in grave danger of missing the next one. I got this. Because we move in one of the nine spiritual gifts, or we use guitars on Sunday morning. It doesn't necessarily qualify you for revival. What if it doesn't look right? And I hate to be the one to tell you this, but in a largely narcissistic culture that has created a narcissistic gospel, that somehow it's about moi rather than about Jesus. Hello? The good news is not about you, it's for you. But in a largely narcissistic culture where we have conscripted everything to make it about me. What if this revival costs you more rather than costing you less? Because we always think, well, when God comes, there's going to be money shooting out of the vents. God's going to finally get my idiot husband straightened out. My children, the offspring of the devil himself, are going to come back. God's going to make it right. What if he doesn't? What if it costs you more? What if it doesn't personally benefit you and me? You realize the greatest revival in human history, at least numerically, is happening right now. But you don't hear about it. You know why? Because of persecution. Mainland China. 
Millions and millions and millions. Perhaps the greatest revival numerically in the history of the globe. But in the midst of horrendous biblical scale persecution, those disciples, when they, they don't do this, when they make a decision, they realize it could cost them their lives, their homes, their families, their employment, everything to follow this Jesus. And yet, that church scattered in these underground house churches, millions and millions and millions of believers. And yet, the culture unchanged. The government unchanged. Many of you have heard about the seven mountains or the seven pillars of influence. That when God moves, he's going to touch all of these things, all these institutions. What if he doesn't? What if Washington, D.C. is still messed up? Will we still call it revival? Wow. And the unique aspects of this outpouring. You know, in both Asbury revivals, spontaneous after a chapel, no central personality, worship, repentance, salvations, reconsecration. The evangelicals freaking out because there was no preaching of the word. And yet, God fell. The great awakenings of the 18th century. Wesley, Whitfield, public preaching. Well, certainly that's what it's going to have to be if it's going to follow the pattern of, of those great revivals of the past. And yet, in that same period of time, 1857 to 1859, there was a tremendous revival that went on in New York City, completely lay-led, a noon prayer meeting where thousands of people got saved, came under the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't hear as much about that one. And churches that have centered around human celebrity and activity are most at risk of missing this. Don't miss it. Because the external circumstances don't come into alignment with all of your expectations. Don't miss it. The very folk that should have figured out this is the Messiah, when he showed up, they missed him. On the basis of failed expectations. And generations since have still missed Jesus. Because certainly this is not what God would look like. This is not how God would do a thing. My Lord. And this expectation plus preparation. These things coming together. It's critical for those of us now that have a word. Like those ten virgins, we have a word. We now even have the beginnings of some experience. But what do we do? And I'm going to close with this. This is one of these preacher closings, so stay with me. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 4. And you knew I was going to get to Second Kings. It's the only book of the Bible I know anything about. But once again, another story. Wife of the company of prophets, he's dead, she's broke. Prophet Elisha comes, says, what have you got in the house? She says, nothing. Whoops, prophet, better not lie. A little oil. He said, great. Send your knuckle-headed sons out of the house. Go to all the neighbors, get every container you can get your hands on, bring it back. She does that. Closes the door. She and her boys are there, so she begins to pour a little bit of oil out. You know this. As long as there were empty vessels, what happened? Oil kept flowing. But when the vessels got full, the oil, the oil stopped. Prophet comes and he says, sell the oil, pay off your debts, watch this, and live on what's left. See, sometimes we fail to catch that last one. Because we'd be satisfied just to deal with the student loans and the mortgage. But God says, live on what's left. I don't know about you, but he moved her from being busted to wealthy. wealthy on the basis of her obedience. But her obedience involved a few things. Number one, getting the next generation involved. Get your sons out there. Get out of the house. We'll come back to that in a moment. 
and then begin to pour out what you have, even if you don't understand it. My goodness. You know, we live in a, in a moment right now. It's not just a FOMO moment. I think it's a faux row moment. What is faux row? It's the fear of running out. It's not just the fear of missing out. It's the fear of running out. And you say, what are you talking about? Well, some of you still using COVID toilet paper. <laughs> Busted! <laughs> some of you were at Walmart at 7 o'clock in the morning in line to get your two rolls. And 5,000 rolls later, you're still using it. (laughs) You see, we get a little empty feeling on the inside, and we begin to rebuke the devil. Well, I'm a child of God. I'm not supposed to. But my Bible also says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You see... We're so afraid, particularly here in Western culture, we're so afraid of running out of something that we're afraid to even give it away. Whether it's our tithes, our offerings, our time, our talents, we're afraid that we might not have enough. It's a fear of running out. Let me just tell you something. God will empty you to make room for himself. And before you get all happy and do this, that may be one of the most terrifying things that you will ever experience. Job, have you considered my man Job? Nobody like him. Then 40 some odd chapters, I'm going to bust him up. I'm going to empty him out. I'm going to ruin his life on the basis of inadequate revelation of who I am. That was it. That was it. Don't underestimate how God will empty a man or a woman's life in order to make room for him. Second, are you fillable? Part of it's space, but what is the condition of your vessel? Years ago, I spoke a message on wineskins. Wineskins, disgusting. In antiquity, how they move liquids, oil, wine, water, taken from the skin of a dead animal. Pour the liquid in so you can move it around. God bless plastic. (laughs) Love my Yeti. Don't test like a dead goat. But this is how they did it. And yet that wine skin was made from the skin of a freshly killed animal. And that wine skin was at its point of maximum flexibility closest to the time of death of the animal. And the more flexible, the greater the capacity. This isn't fun. So my capacity is in direct relationship to my flexibility, but my flexibility is in direct proportion to my mortality. How much am I willing to die to? How much How much am I willing to die to in order to have the greatest flexibility in order to contain the most of God in this moment? And some of you have been in this moment of God emptying you out. God killing some things around your life. Congratulations. Stop rebuking the devil. And thank God for his preparation he's bringing to pour himself into you. Are you fillable? Relying on someone else's oil. Oh, I love Pastor D. She can break out that word. She's prophetic. (laughs) Woo! I love me some Pastor D. And I can get all the way to Tuesday afternoon on the basis of that word. (laughs) Doesn't work that way. You've got to get your own oil. You can't rely on these folk down here to be the constant purveyors of oil for your life. And then recognizing what you have and releasing it. 
I've only got a little bit. I've only got a one talent or a two talent gift. It doesn't matter. I can't prophesy like Pastor D. You got a one word? <laughs> then open your mouth and speak that to somebody. Yeah. You might be shocked at how it unlocks a life. To take whatever that little bit of oil is. And let me tell you, the idea that we would say back to God, I don't have, coming off of Easter. Coming off of Easter. That he said that unless I go, another won't come. But if I leave, I'll send the Holy Ghost to you. For you and I to say to God, I don't have any oil. When the third person of himself that required his death on that cross to release the Holy Spirit into your life and mine. How dare we testify to the God in heaven that we don't have any oil. You've got all on the basis of the Holy Spirit who now lives on the inside of you. But you wonder why some people seem to have more than you do? Well, because God loves him more than he loves me. No. It's because they've been willing to pour that oil out. And guess what? The oil kept coming. My goodness. For churches, and I'm really closing with this, so you can play louder now. (laughs) Keyboard players got it rough, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Musicians always catch a short end of the deal, don't they? (laughs) But for churches, I think God's looking for four containers. I really am going to close with this. Thank you for your patience. The first is prayer. You see, prayer creates the vessel. And I'm not talking about the, one, you know, the, 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 the Bob prayer. I need, I need, I need. I'm talking about the prayer that Jesus said, not my will, but thy will. And emptying out of everything that we think we need or want. For God to hand back to us what he wants us to have in a given moment. An emptying prayer that is always prerequisite to a filling prayer. He's looking for folks that are going to do that. That's why I love preaching here. That's why I love your, love your leaders is that I know that prayer, mm, it's in everything that you do. Then worship. Jesus encounter with the woman at the well as she's trying to instruct him about worship. Don't have a theological discussion with God. You lose. <laughs> But this is the kind of worship that the Father is looking for in a people. And we are in desperate need of a worship reformation in our churches. Because worship has been conscripted to be about us now rather than directed to and for God. True worship the Father is looking for. He's looking for gathering of empty containers. That means you've got to get out of the house. Not talk about it. You got to go. You got to go find empty containers and find the emptiest containers. And many times they're the folk that are some place in society that everybody else has given up on them. And you go find empty containers. Let me just tell you, you bring them in the house. God will fill them. You'll have all the oil you know what to do with. And here's the last one. It's giving. Acts, the 10th chapter. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost for the Jews. Acts chapter 10, Pentecost for the Gentiles. Man's by the name of Cornelius. You know what got God's attention about Cornelius? Two things. Prayer and giving. Peter had this revelation that got him to the house of Cornelius. And when Peter showed up the next day, Pentecost broke out for the Gentiles. But what was it that got God's attention about the house of Cornelius? Giving and prayer. Let me tell you, this is a moment to give. We're not buying revival. Don't hear me. 
They'll hear the wrong thing. But we are responding to something. This is what real giving is responding to something. And let me tell you, a church that's got these four containers, let me tell you, when the rain comes. It's got somewhere to go. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this amazing church. Lord, so easy to minister here because all of this is already in place. This is simply confirmation on everything that these people live, everything that they've been hearing. But God, I'm asking that God, those hundred salvations that could be 150, we don't know the, the exact number. But God, we are seeing it here now in this place. Let us not miss the day of your visitation on the basis of our expectations. Raise the standard. In Jesus' name, amen.